Welcome to Alaska Weather. I'm meteorologist Amanda Bowen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. As always, you have that phone number at the bottom of the screen that you can get a forecast anytime. There's also our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. Find all kinds of weather and climate information on there. And if you have any comments or feedback for us, please feel free to email us at nws.ar.tvweather at noaa.gov. We'll go ahead and get straight into the weather because there is a lot to discuss. We have winter weather advisories across much of the interior, stretching all the way from the Northeastern Brooks Range down through the Tanana Valley. That is going to be for snow and blowing snow in effect through Thursday morning. So we're looking at new snow as well as some strong winds creating blowing snow with visibility concerns, especially for travel conditions and along those highway passes north of Fairbanks and into the Brooks Range. We also have a blizzard warning that's going to be expiring soon. That expires at 6 p.m. this evening for the Bering Strait Coast and at 10 p.m. this evening, that's Wednesday evening, for the Chukchi Sea Coast. So expect a little bit longer of blizzard potential whiteout conditions um, along that area of the west coast. As we look a little bit further south, we have more winter weather advisories in effect. One is for the Bristol Bay area that's going to be north of Iliamna in that area for new snow anywhere from 6 to 12 inches. That one is in effect through 1 p.m. on Thursday. So expect plenty more new snow in the Bristol Bay area north of Iliamna through Thursday. We also have winter weather advisory out for the Anchorage and Matanuska Valley areas. That is also going to be in effect from this evening. That's 10 p.m. Wednesday through 4 p.m. on Thursday. Expect new snow totals anywhere from about 3 to 10 inches in that area. The lowest snow amounts are going to be in the lower elevations of the Anchorage area and the Anchorage Bowl itself. Highest amounts in the Anchorage hillside as well as some higher amounts up in the favorite areas in the Matanuska Valley. Again that's in effect Wednesday night through most of the day on Thursday. As we head into our satellite imagery we can see a boundary that is set up from the Bering Sea all the way across into the northern Gulf, clouds associated with that boundary. We can also see clouds associated with that system over the interior. That's what's bringing the snow and blowing snow to the interior. But what you don't see is a whole lot over the panhandle. You notice we didn't have any hazards for the panhandle as well. So hopefully a welcome break, at least temporarily, for the area of the panhandle. For today, we do have that low pressure system coming into the northwestern portion of the state that is dragging a trough behind it and all of that bringing that snow and blowing snow into the interior. As we head into tonight, we'll see that low continue off to the northeast, going to be off into the Beaufort Sea, but continuing some breezy conditions as well as snow across much of the interior. We also have a weak low over the south central area, and that's what's going to be bringing that snow to uh, the Anchorage and Matanuska Valley areas. Heading into Thursday, we see that same low basically just over the same area, South Central and Prince William Sound, continuing snow for that area, and then weakening low pressure system over the interior as well, continuing some snow for the interior as well. But we do see a break for Thursday along the West Coast, things starting to dry out a little bit of recuperating after that wind and snow, those blizzard conditions for portions of the West Coast. And then for Friday, we have our next low pressure system, even though it's weak, still approaching the west coast 
on Friday, bringing some more snow and breezy conditions to Southwest, all the way from Seward Peninsula down into the Alaska Peninsula. We also see the return of rain and snow to the Panhandle with weak low pressure there. Rain for the Southern Panhandle and snow, it looks like for the Northern Panhandle on Friday. Looking at temperatures for Thursday morning, we are looking uh, quite a lot warmer than we've been for the past week or so. South Central looking at 30 degrees in Anchorage, uh, 21 up in the Matanuska Valley, and then we're looking at 32 at Seward, looking like 20s and 30s in the Panhandle, 34 there at Kodiak. For Thursday morning across the north side of the state, we are looking at negative single digits to even some positive single digits along the north slope. A little bit warmer across the interior with temperatures in the teens. And then Thursday morning across the southwest portion of the state, warmer for the Alaska Peninsula, temperatures in the 30s, but cooler in the teens for the YK Delta area. Thursday afternoon, temperatures getting all the way up into the mid 40s at the warmest for the Southern Panhandle, approaching 40 even for the Northern Panhandle, and some mid 30s, uh, warmest temperatures we've probably seen in a while for South Central as well as the Kenai Peninsula with 40 degrees there at Homer. For the northern part of the state Thursday afternoon, we are looking at high temperatures in the teens for the Beaufort Sea Coast, still single digits on the positive side for the Chukchi Sea Coast, and temperatures approaching around 30 degrees for much of the interior around Fairbanks and the Alaska Range. For Southwest, getting all the way up into the 30s to near 40 degrees for the Alaska Peninsula, 36 there at Dillingham for Thursday afternoon. A little bit cooler along the Yukon Delta area with 18 to 20 degrees along the Norton Sound coast. For Friday morning, again, we're looking at rather warm temperatures, at least for the Panhandle. Temperatures only getting down to as low as about 30 degrees in the Northern Panhandle and just the mid 30s for the Southern Panhandle as we'll see that rain moving into the area. Cooler again across South Central and into Kodiak Island. Temperatures in the teens to mid 20s for the Kenai Peninsula. 30 degrees there at Kodiak expected on Friday morning. Definitely a cool down for the northern half of the state on Friday morning, back into the negative teens to negative 20s for the north slope, looking at single digits across portions of the interior with just into the double digits, 10 degrees, um, a, a frequent number across the interior as well. And then for southwest, cool again there with teens across much of the area. For Friday afternoon, we'll see for the Panhandle, some temperatures getting close to 50 degrees, 46 there for the Southern Panhandle, looking like another warmer than it has been day for South Central and the Matsu Valley with temperatures in the mid 30s. And then cool for the north side of the state, negative single digits as highs for the North Slope and 30s mostly for the Southwestern portion of the state. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to a look at your aviation weather, starting with flying weather on Thursday morning. We're looking at quite a lot of IFR conditions, all the way from the North Slope, down pretty much the entire West Coast to the Eastern Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula, and then also across much of the interior, including down through South Central and over to the Eastern border with Canada. For Thursday afternoon, we see quite a lot of improvement across much of the state, at least to MVFR conditions, with IFR conditions still hanging around for the North Slope and much of the Brooks Range, as well as developing IFR conditions across much of the Panhandle. For Friday morning, we'll once again see IFR conditions through much of the West Coast all the way up to the North Shore of Norton Sound and then stretching inland across the Alaska Range. IFR conditions also for the North Slope of the Brooks Range up to the North Coast on the East Side and IFR conditions across the Panhandle. For Friday afternoon though, MVFR conditions across 
most of the mainland with some VFR even for the North Slope and South Central. MVFR conditions for much of the Panhandle with IFR in the higher terrain and then also IFR coming in with our next system into the Western Aleutians. Pass conditions on Thursday, Anaktuvik Pass as well as Adigan Pass IFR conditions. IFR in the morning at Lake Clark and Merrill Passes becoming MVFR Thursday afternoon. At Rainy Pass, we're also looking at IFR Thursday morning, improving to MVFR on Thursday afternoon. And Windy Pass as well, IFR in the morning hours, improving to MVFR in the afternoon, but we'll maintain IFR conditions on the north side of Windy Pass, so keep that in mind if you have plans to fly through there. Isabel Pass looking like IFR all day on Thursday. Then Tasta Pass, MVFR on Thursday. Tanita Pass, IFR in the morning hours, improving to MVFR during the afternoon on Thursday. Portage Pass, same story, IFR in the morning, improving to MVFR in the afternoon. And Chilkoot and White Passes both starting Thursday out VFR, but deteriorating to IFR on Thursday afternoon. Taking a look at our freezing levels, we have our surface freezing level across the Panhandle into Prince William Sound and then across the Alaska Peninsula out into the Bering Sea and then crossing the Western Aleutians. Our warmer air coming up into the Gulf with the 2000 foot line, just making it up into the Southern portion of the Panhandle. Icing on Thursday, lots of isolated moderate icing across much of the state for the Panhandle between about 4,000 and 10,000 feet. For Southwest and South Central, as well as the Aleutians between about 2,000 and 6,000 feet icing. And for the Northern half of the mainland between about 1,000 and 8,000 feet, some isolated moderate icing. Our jet stream on Thursday, main jet coming across the Western Aleutians, dipping down just south of the Aleutians, and then arcing back north across the Alaska Peninsula, South Central, and even across the Panhandle. So we're looking at 120 knots out of the Northwest above the Western Aleutians, and then 115 all the way up to about 140 knots out of the West from the Alaska Peninsula, all the way up to the very northernmost portion of the Panhandle. At 9,000 feet, we have a low over eastern Russia and our strongest winds south of that low over the Bering, even some over the western Aleutians, about 60 to 70 knots out of the west and northwest, and then some additional strong winds over the northern Gulf and portions of the Panhandle, 45 to 65 knots there out of the west. At 3,000 feet, Again, our strongest winds south of that low that's over eastern Russia, so most of our strong winds over the Bering Sea, impacting the western Aleutians a little bit with winds 40 to 45 knots out of the west. Also peaking about 45 knots out of the west over the northern Gulf. And finally, for turbulence, we have some considerable moderate turbulence over the western Aleutians for Thursday below about 3,000 feet. For the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, below about 4,000 feet. And finally, considerable moderate turbulence over the south or the southernmost or southwesternmost portion of the panhandle that's going to be below about 6,000 feet on Thursday. Stay tuned for more Alaska weather after this. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining me once again is Eric Stevens from the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, or GINA, based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Eric, welcome back to the show. Well, Dave, it's great to be back. Thanks for inviting us again. Sure thing. And, and today we want to talk about identifying burn scars. That would be the, the burned up area after a wildfire when the flames and the smoke are gone. We can see it if you drive by it on the roadway, of course, but uh, from satellite, we can also identify those, uh, those places on the land, right? You know it. Um, you know that expression, ouch, that's going to leave a mark? Yeah. Uh, after you bang your knee uh, getting out of the car? You, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the ouch, it's going to leave a mark, that also applies to the landscape. Whenever a wildfire ravages through, it's going to leave a mark on mm -hmm. the landscape. After a wildfire burns out, this is called a burn scar. Okay. And you can ask yourself, well, that's interesting. We can see a burn scar from space. Right. Um, then the question is, well, why right. does that matter? Okay. Who cares? Yeah, fire's over. 
They're, right, the fire is over. We don't need to worry about this anymore. It turns out you kind of do, okay. because burn scars are important. Uh, there's this old rule of thumb in the weather business that flood follows fire. Okay. The action of the fire in, in killing off the vegetation, in baking, uh, kiln drying the landscape a little mm -hmm. bit, can hinder the land's ability to absorb rainfall. So if you have a fire, especially if it's in complex mountainous terrain. Right. This is classic in California. Mm -hmm. It can happen somewhat in Alaska too. You get a wildfire in, in steep hilly or mountainous terrain, rips off all the lands, or off the uh, vegetation off the landscape. Mm -hmm. Then six months later, there's a big rainstorm and you get a flash flood in that area. So right. flood can follow fire. That's why you gotta okay. know where the burn scars That's important. are. Secondly, a fire needs fuel to maintain itself. So mm -hmm. if there's an old burn scar left over from a year or two ago, and then another summer later here in Alaska in the interior, mm -hmm. it's a big wildfire season. If there's a fire advancing toward an old burn scar, well, guess what? That old burn scar is going to be tougher terrain for that new fire to get through because there's not right. as much fuel okay. in that burn scar. So they almost act like a natural fire break. These are a couple of reasons why you need to know where those burn scars are. Alaska Fire Service has limited resources. They want to put their people and their equipment sure. where it does the most good. They need to know, well, this is an area where there's no burn scar. We better put people here because that fire could really run. So That's really, we really important for uh, weather forecasters and fire weather forecasters for sure. Oh, yeah. But then how do we weather satellites actually detect those burn scars? Ah, good question. Thanks. Well, let's, let's turn the Wayback Machine to the summer of 2015. That was okay. a very active year. We've got a picture here taken up in the White Mountains. This is uh, one of the fires in progress that summer, mm -hmm. and if you look real close, you can almost see Frodo throwing the ring into right. the no kidding. volcano there, so that's uh, quite the vision. Well, let's look at a visible image. Here we are okay. in Alaska's interior. This is before the fires got out of the cage mm -hmm. in early summer of 2015. Let's zoom in to the western interior here. Again, this is a weather satellite image of visible light, what the right. human eye can see. Okay. We're into the middle reach of the Yukon Valley there in the western interior, Galena area. And this is just a beautiful visible day. Uh, nothing much going on. It's, it's early, it's in early June before the fires really yeah. got active. But then in 2015, the fires got loose, especially in that western interior. Right. Here's another image, mm -hmm. the same satellite pass okay. as that visible image, but now we're not quite looking at visible light. Very different. There's a slight change here. This image incorporates something called the veggie band. Okay. 0.86 micron wavelength. The micron's very tiny, yeah. but that wavelength responds to vegetation, the chlorophyll. So trees oh. and grasses reflect that part of the electromagnetic spectrum back to the satellite. And so the satellite sees that. When signal comes at that wavelength to the satellite, we know, ah, there's some vegetation growing there. This is great. You can identify coastlines so easily because you go from vegetation to water. Um, turns out if you have a burn scar, guess what? Mm. You burned away the vegetation, so okay. that's going to show up. We're going to do a before, during, and after kind of look here. And so okay. we're looking at before. So in this image, we've got a lot of green out there. That's wonderful. Right. Another fun thing about this kind of imagery is you can see down in the Alaska Range in the southeast oh. corner of the image, it's blue. Yeah. That's glaciers and snow oh, in the course. mountains. Okay. So this is not really what the human eye can see. This mm -hmm. is a these wavelengths are beyond human vision, but we've, we've made them look certain colors. So the, the vegetation looks green. Now let's look at that same kind of satellite mm -hmm. uh, recipe, but during the fires. This is in July. The fires are loose. You can see the smoke in the middle of the image, the smearing look of the smoke. And then we can see some clouds that are white. Uh, icy yeah. clouds are blue. So this is in July of 2015. The fires are doing their thing. We're okay. burning up millions of acres. Now let's go to September. The fires are out. The audience has left the theater. You know, the event's over, right? right. We're done. But guess what? Now look at those brown oh, patches. All of those places are where the fire has burned away the vegetation. So you can see where the fire is where you can add the, up these perimeters, get acreage burned mm -hmm. and such. And so that's good to know. Now remember, flood follows fire, and yeah. these are also natural fire breaks. So you need to know where these guys are. In the course of the 2015 summer season, we went from before with not much burn scar in this area to just a couple months later, we can see so much burn scarring on the landscape. What's interesting, wow. too, about the satellite and looking at burn scars is you, you realize that burn scars are the gift that keeps on giving. Uh -huh. You can forget that a couple of years ago, maybe there was a fire in a certain area, but the satellite won't forget. So in the summertime, we get wildfires in Alaska, but guess what? Um, in, the, in the visible imagery here, we can see the burn scars just a little bit. 
but they're not as prominent as in that veggie band. But then you can't see them at all if you cover them up with snow, right? right. Exactly. So here's okay. an image okay. from the middle of the oh, winter time. Wow. And snow on the ground by this, this recipe mm -hmm. looks blue. Again, these are wavelengths of light that the human eye can't really see. We're getting up into the infrared, near infrared. And the way we've assigned colors is if there's snow on the ground or there's a glacier, it looks blue, kind of intuitive. So this is uh, early April of the following year, 2016. Okay. We're just about to get into breakup. We've got a lot of snow on the ground. It's now it's all going to melt. And as the snow melts, then you get our final image here. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this look familiar? This looks like a lot of what we saw in September okay. of the previous summer. So this mm -hmm. is the spring of the next year. Okay. These, the fires themselves might not have overwintered. They're gone, but the right. fire scar does. Yep. And as the snow melts away, and then we have, you have breakup, and then you have green up, uh -huh. when every, the leaves come out, the grass comes back, except in the burned areas, they're having a tough time because everything got burned off the previous year. So you can see these scars even sure. the next summer, multiple years. It depends on how, what kind of vegetation there is. You know, mm -hmm. some of the tussocky tundra grasses, they'll grow back really quick. But to get a, a forest to come back, that'll take much longer. So these burn scars, eventually the, the landscape will, will fill in the burn scar. It will heal itself, if you want to use that metaphor. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the next few years, you can still keep track of these on satellite. And again, the reason we want to do that is that uh, the burn scar can facilitate a flood right. and it can act like a, a fire break. So there you are. The Fascinating veggie band. tools. So if you're a weather satellite and you're looking at my uh, bowl of vegetables here, you might be able to pick out which one's the pea, which one's the tomato, and which one's the carrot and, and apply that information. Uh, precisely to whatever it is you're, you're working on there. That is really fascinating stuff that we have that capability from so high above the planet Earth, and right. Alaska for that matter. Yep. Eric, Eat your veggies. Yes, definitely. I think I will. I'm hungry. Thanks so much for joining us again, Eric, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. We'll see you right here next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back for a look at your marine forecast. Starting with the sea ice edge, we expect the ice to continue to retreat over the next week or so, especially with that low pressure system that's gonna be moving through the bearing this weekend, bringing some southerly winds behind it for some retreat of the ice edge. But next week, as we get northerly flow back in place, we may see some restoration of that ice and even some more growth or pushing south. Taking a look at our winds and seas over southeast for Thursday, we are looking at westerly flow across the eastern gulf 15 to 20 knots with seas 8 to 10 feet. And for those inside waterways, more southeasterly flow 10 to 25 knots with two to five foot seas. For Friday, westerly flow still and across the Gulf with more southeasterly and southerly flow across the inside waterways. Winds coming up, especially in those northern inside waterways, Lynn Canal area, 25 knots gust to 40 knots, but winds actually coming down a little bit across the Gulf 15 to 20 knots. For South Central on Thursday, we are looking at 15 to 25 knots across the Gulf with about eight foot seas. We've got some northeasterly flow in Prince William Sound, 10 knots with about two foot seas, and five to seven foot seas with some southwesterly flow in Cook Inlet. For Friday, we have those winds 15 to 25 knots out of the west for the Gulf. Seas coming down maybe just a little bit to about seven to eight feet. Still about three to six feet for Cook Inlet with 10 to 20 knot winds. For the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island areas on Thursday, we have westerly and southwesterly flow, anywhere from 15 to 20 knots on the north side of the peninsula to 20 to even 30 knots on the west side or south side of the peninsula. And looking at anywhere from six to about 10 feet seas across the board. For Friday, those winds becoming a little bit more consistent, 20 to 25 knots out of the west, and seas anywhere from about 4 to 9 feet. For the Aleutians on Thursday, 
we're looking at our lightest winds in the eastern Aleutians out of the northwest, about 15 knots, increasing a little bit into the central Aleutians out of the west at about 20 knots, and then some gales for the western Aleutians out of the southwest at about 35 knots. Seas following much of the same pattern, seven to nine feet for the central and eastern Aleutians and peaking about 14 feet for the western Aleutians on Thursday. As we head into Friday, we're looking at 20 to 25 knot winds across the board out of the southwest and west and seas more consistent as well in that eight to 12 foot range. For the west coast on Thursday, we're looking at westerly flow across the ice from Norton Sound all the way down to south of Nunavak Island, 10 to 15 knots out of the west, 15 to 20 knots just outside of the sea ice edge. That's going to be out of the south and southwest with about eight foot seas. And for Friday, 15 to 25 knots across the ice with a little bit of a mix up in the wind directions. We've got some easterly flow in Norton Sound, but then westerly flow as we get down south of Nunavak Island. And then gales coming into the area uh, just outside of the ice, 35 knot winds out of the west with about 17 foot seas. For Thursday along the Arctic coast, we're looking at northerly winds 15 to 20 knots with some northwesterly or westerly flow on either side of the Bering Strait. And then heading into Friday, westerly flow 10 knots across the north slope and northerly and northeasterly flow 15 to 20 knots for much of the Chukchi Sea. Recapping as we go into tonight and Thursday, we have winter weather advisories in effect for much of the interior and into Thursday down all the way through South Central. Finally, for Friday, a little bit of a break for the northern half of the state, but we do have another low pressure system coming onto the west coast and bringing more snow there. Still some lingering snow on Friday for south central, and after a dry day or two, we're looking at a return to rain and snow with for the panhandle with snow across the northern panhandle and rain across the southern panhandle. Thanks so much for watching Alaska TV Weather. We hope to see you back here again tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.